everybody. Welcome to the Trading, Learning, and Development community. Thanks for joining us. It's Wednesday, and um, we've got another member showcase. I love these. The uh, member showcases are one of my favorite things to do with TLDC. And our guest today is Laura Middlesworth. Um, Laura is a, a member of, of TLDC and has a really interesting story that I'm really looking into uh, to, to, to finding out more. Actually, at least from what it looks to me on her LinkedIn profile, it looks like an interesting story. So um, we're just going to get into it um, right now. So uh, some of you, if, if any of you out there in our live audience are new to these member showcases, what we do is we have a series of questions that we ask our guests. And um, if you have any questions yourself, feel free to add them in chat or even add them in the ask a question area. Uh, you can find that at the bottom of the screen and um, we'll do our best to get to your question. And, uh, you know, hopefully th uh, this conversation will spurn some questions from you because I do think that that Laura has an interesting story to get into. So let's just get right into it. Um, Laura, your L&D journey, like where exactly did it begin? Because let me just start out from what I can see on your profile, you have a PhD in philosophy which is very, very cool because when I was in college, I actually really considered change, switching my major from English to philosophy. So love that. And then economics, you got, you have, I think an MA in economics, which is- Yeah, and actually the PhD is in economics too. I'll have to go back and make sure I didn't- Oh, okay. <laughs> slip something in there that shouldn't be there. Wait, you don't <laughs> so. have a PhD in philosophy and economics, do you? No, oh, no, okay. I just have too many degrees in economics. So Okay, okay. <laughs> do you have a philosophy degree? No, but a PhD, and maybe this is what I have to go back and check, right? But the PH and the PhD is philosophy, right? Oh, philosophy oh, oh, in economics. Right, right. So, oh, maybe I read it wrong. Okay. Ah, uh, well, <laughs> it could be a mistake on my end. A good excuse to go in and update my LinkedIn profile. Regardless, and then you were, um, you were, you were an instructional designer or a trainer at NASA, and then um, now you you've got your own freelance um, business. But where did it all start? Where did this journey into uh, learning and development begin? Yeah. Well, thanks all for having me. Thanks, Louise, for mm -hmm. moderating and the invitation. My journey really started as a, being a teacher. So with all those degrees in economics, I was a tenure track faculty uh, teaching economics at the university level. And that really was born out of, you know, a childhood sort of daydream of being a teacher. I just didn't necessarily envision it would happen at that level or in that subject area. But I've always been interested in education because I just I see it and from my personal experience I think it's can be such a a catalyst for change and opportunity and so paying it forward and helping to um helping others really to connect to opportunities and to what's possible is really what got me into being an educator and I think that I will always refer to myself as an educator be, just because of that that outlook so I was teaching economics and economics, for those of you who love it, that's great, but the vast majority of people do not love economics. And so my journey into instructional design was, as many others are, kind of accidental because I was looking for just any way to make a very technical, often dry, boring subject more interesting or more useful for the people stuck in my economics courses. And that's when I think my first experience with instructional design principles or practices was with backwards design, right? Just, I was at a workshop on campus and that approach was, I was introduced to it and it just, I mean, blew my mind is an understatement for sure. Wow. So, yeah. That's marvelous. And so um, here you are teaching e economics. And so what was it? Was it were you getting into the technical side of things? Did you feel like, oh, I like this e-learning development or what was it about L&D that was really um, something that you wanted to dive into? Do you, what did you find yourself really attracted to? Well, I really, in hindsight, looking back at what I started doing um, when I was trying to do things differently or just find a different angle for teaching econ, I was making, and this is this is back when, uh, making YouTube videos was a 
you know, a new thing, a uh, edgy thing. But I started making little YouTube clips of, um, especially I was teaching an applied statistics course, talk about dry and boring and eyes glazing over. Um, but part of it was just hands-on practical uh, data exploration and estimation and all this stuff. But most of the students that were in my classroom were not bringing in laptops. It just wasn't part of the culture, you know, that era that was just not a typical thing to do. And so me showing them what I was doing and working with data and running estimations and models and all this stuff, they were just passive. And so I start, it was like, okay, well, they're going back to their dorm rooms or the library or going back home and they're doing their homework there. So I should make these little YouTube videos so that they can watch the videos when they're doing the things. And so that's really what set me on the path of what now I would call instructional design. But at the time, I did not even know that this was a thing, <laughs> you know, that people did for a full-time focus. And I just started doing more and more of that. I became one of the campus's champions for the technology enhanced classrooms. And I was a huge proponent of active learning practices. And so I constantly was being brought in as a faculty member who could help other faculty members see what was possible either by using technology or by using more active learning um, practices in the classroom instead of spending so much time on passive instruction. And then I just got to the point where that was what I loved most. And that's where I felt like I was making my biggest contributions, but that started to be at odds with what the priorities of the, you know, the reality of being a tenure track faculty member, um, the department that I was in was like, oh, that's so great that you do that on your free time, but we mm. need you to do less of that. And we need you to do more of the things that was going to take me away from teaching and uh, working directly with students. And that's when it just, and this now in hindsight, again, has started to become a common theme, right? When I've found that my own values and priorities are at odds with the ones that you know, feel like they're part of the culture in the workplace, then I just know it's time to move on. And it was a week or two ago that Lisa was on and she mentioned something about that, right? As a freelancer, just knowing, you know, what it is, your own goals and your own priorities and staying strong in that and that that can be really helpful as a freelancer. And it was like, oh yeah, that's been true in all of my work experiences, but sometimes there's this awkward period where you're trying to figure that out. It's like, mm -hmm. hmm, do I need to make a change on my end? Is it me? Is it them? Is this just not a good fit? So that's a rambling answer to your question, Louise. No, and it's totally I'll relevant it too, because I think, and, and it's funny because uh, I feel like since the year has started, we've been talking a lot about sort of career changes and people kind of finding their path and, and even sort of understanding that it takes a, a certain amount of courage to be willing to sort of really listen to what your gut is telling you and, 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 and going with it. Right. So um, you've had to do that. Now I'm trying to figure that may, it was sort of in, was this like around when you were, it looks like you were senior lecturer at the university of Wisconsin was mm -hmm. when were you making YouTube videos and are you still a YouTuber? Uh, I, I mean, I have a YouTube channel, but I even recently have gone back and hidden a lot of those videos. That I, <laughs> so the YouTube video phase was probably eight or nine years ago. That's when I really started wow. doing that. Right. Okay. So that's and I, I was a lecturer at the university a couple of years ago when the pandemic started. But that was after my faculty year. Okay. So, yeah, my LinkedIn profile. They love a linear career path and mine is just not necessarily <laughs> one that fits that bill. Uh, let's see, I made the transition to instructional design full time. I believe it was 2014, so about mm -hmm. seven years ago. And I was fortunate that the university that I was uh, teaching at, that I was ready to put in my resignation as a faculty member and the learning technology director called me, how are you? Oh, can we keep you but maybe that you're more interested in? And so this was the unit on campus that often would ask that I come in and do workshops or to work with other faculty members who are looking to add in technology or active learning. And so I was 
I mean, that was such a absolutely important step in my career. And I'm so grateful that that played out the way it did. But I spent a year and a half on that same campus now with a full-time focus as an instructional design consultant. And again, working with faculty and staff doing all the stuff that I loved. And that was really a great stepping stone. I'm not sure that I could have asked for a better one, really. No, that's great. And Laura, just real quick, I'm not sure if anyone else is experiencing it. Your video is cutting out. I'm getting um, really clear audio out, but um, for some oh. reason, I don't, I'm not quite getting your video in. Could be a connection on my end, but we'll just keep going. Um, um, but I just want to um, to okay. call that out real quick. Now, then you actually went into the hospitality industry, right? You started yeah. um, working as a manager learning of L&D um, at Marriott. Yeah. So I, before I was at Marriott, I was at United Healthcare. So I worked in health insurance and I moved over to tra travel and hospitality. And pre-pandemic, my little summary of the contrast there was that a bad day in hospitality is much better than a bad day um, working for a health insurer. Um, however, then <laughs> COVID <laughs> struck and then it was like, oh, actually, you know, there are some pretty uh, not great days in travel and hospitality. So uh, after COVID hit, that was, uh, a mo right, I got furloughed along with the, yeah. the vast majority of the learning and development organization at Marriott. And I'm sure that was not specific to that particular hospitality company. And so then it was time to make a pivot, you know, yeah. for, in that case, reasons other than what I would have chosen for once, but it was time to move on. So I spent a little time at Western Governors University. That was a great experience because their competency-based education model is just very different from traditional higher ed. I worked on a fantastic team with still the most amazing leader I've ever worked for. And then I got a call from NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory. And it was one of those moments where it was like, I, I'm not sure this is ever going to happen again, right? It was an application I had put in on a whim months and months prior, right? At the very start of the pandemic when I got furloughed from Marriott. And I knew that even though at the moment I was very happy and content in my professional life and very curious where it could lead, but I knew I would regret it if I didn't you know, if I didn't try for for NASA. So, and I'm happy to talk about that a little bit, but I have left. And so it is, and I, it's just been a month or so, and I still feel like I'm processing all of what's happened. It both wow. was a dream come true. And also it was a disappointment all wrapped up in one. And wow. so, yeah. yeah, no, I mean, it over the last couple of years, it just seems like there's been so much movement in your career. Now, I just want to back up real quick. Just yeah. um, talk a little bit about your shift from going um, from higher ed and then all of a sudden just working hospitality. That must have had its own sort of challenges. Was that something that is that something you could speak on at all? Absolutely. Yeah. Higher ed versus workplace learning and development. I found initially the biggest differences included the pace, <laughs> right? In higher ed, uh, traditional higher ed, at least, there's a cadence and a, these sort of natural rhythms to the timelines because of the semesters or the quarters of the school year. And of course, in the corporate world, uh, there might be a cadence or a pattern based off of an annual uh, accounting year, or um, in the case of health insurance, there's mm -hmm. the changes in the annual enrollment periods and hospitality, there's seasonal changes with travel patterns and such. But um, the pace, of course, was quite different. And then also going from uh, more of a, let's see, how do I put this? more of an expert focused approach. So higher ed, a lot of my work was working with professors or staff, academic staff who were experts in their field and they knew exactly what their subject matter was. Mm. And they just wanted maybe to consult with someone like myself to repackage it or to deliver it in a different way. And then in the workplace, of course, you're working with a variety of individuals and some of them may be experts, some of them, sometimes you have to make stuff up or do your best with limited information. And so it was much more, um, there was a lot more variety. It was a lot quicker pace. But also, I think the thing for me that was such a huge difference and continues to play into my um, 
my own choices and approach is that as an individual contributor, I was having to sort of follow the commands of uh, leaders, right? So whether those were L&D leaders in the corporation or it was uh, business leaders on the operations side, there's a lot of really important people much higher up than me that I was having to execute their orders. And I don't know that I'm the best corporate minion. I think uh, that's probably the easiest way for me to summarize that. No, I get it. And and, and I'm sure we're going to talk about that a little bit too once we start talking about your... Um, uh, your move to freelancing. And mm -hmm. so, but I do want to back up. So I'm, I get so curious about this stuff. The great, the best leader you've ever worked for. Yes. I just want to touch on that a little bit. Can you, can you tell me why? So uh, her name is Emily. It's easier for me to rip. Yes. Corporate minion with the crying, laughing face is appropriate, Bobby. So Emily, the best leader I've ever worked for. She still is a leader at Western Governors University. And she both challenges her people and cares deeply. And I think that that combination, at least in my experience thus far, is, is such a helpful motivator and source of fuel in a positive mm -hmm. way, but at the same time, it seems so rare, but maybe that's just my limited experiences thus far. But, and I'm, I'm still in touch with her and I'm so curious as to what has helped her cultivate that type of leadership approach. Yeah. But it was amazing because the team I was on, there were maybe 10 of us as instructional designers at different levels mm -hmm. and uh, years of experience. And ev it was the most functional team I've ever been a part of, period, workplace yeah. or sports or anything. And it was amazing to me that she was so in tune with what each individual uh, was striving for either personally or professionally and the level they were at. And she was always pinpointing opportunities for each individual to stretch a bit beyond where they currently were, but also everyone always felt supported and everybody was contributing. I don't know about anyone else, but for me, any team I've been on, there's always the, you know, the leaders of the pack and those that are kind of the stragglers. Mm -hmm. And it's important to keep everybody moving in the same direction. But this was the only time so far that I've been on a team where it felt like we were all running in the same direction at the same pace mm -hmm. and everyone felt included and like we had a sense of belonging. I, I don't even know how else to explain it. It's yeah, kind of boggling. No, it, it makes sense to me. I actually, I, you know, I mean, having been, you know, I'm a working professional, like definitely middle-aged and I've worked for lots of folks and it wasn't until, you know, maybe five years ago that I worked for a leader that I was like, I would follow you into a burning house. You were just so amazing. And, um, but then I worked for her for like six months and then she retired. And then after that, mm -hmm. the team that I was on just completely, you know, imploded. It was terrible, but the whole time we're like, wow, she was just this amazing human that, I don't know. Every time that I would sit down with her, I almost wanted to cry because I'm like, you just are so cool. What the heck? But yeah. Um, anyway, yeah, no, working for a great leader is, is, is so important. And, and, um, and I love hearing about that. At some point, I wish I could put together a podcast where I could just interview great leaders because I'm just so curious about, uh, about them. Now let's get to the, the NASA stuff. Okay. Yeah. Um, I don't know what, what to ask. Just like, what was that like? That is, you know, kind of the, every geek out there was like, what you work for NASA. That must have been incredible, but yeah. Tell us a little bit about that. I will. Yeah. It, I, it's still, still forming. So I'll do my best to keep it short and sweet and interesting, but NASA has a dozen or so centers and the jet propulsion laboratory in Pasadena is the only one that is not, real NASA, I'm using air quotes on, on screen, and they are a federally funded research and development center, and they're kind of like a rebel. And I'm, I'm going to do this disclaimer up front because I don't want to, I don't want to burst too many bubbles out there because I myself, you know, dreamt of being an astronaut, working for NASA someday, and I still feel very honored to have had the opportunity. But it's a very traditional, the workplace was very traditional and very hierarchical, and it reminded me a lot of being back in the academic world. And the corner of the lab, they, they refer to it as a lab, 
at Jet Propulsion Laboratory was I think I just got stuck in the wrong corner. And mm -hmm. so uh, the people at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory that I interacted with were some of the most amazing humans ever. And my favorite part of working there was the fact that people were free to be themselves, quirky and unique and nerdy and you know super into their specialty. And I do love that about uh, my time there because every time I got to meet someone new, I was just absolutely fascinated by their story of how they got into what they're they're researching or what they're working on. And then, you know, what their favorite part about that was. The people are endlessly fascinating. So that is cool, right? And of course, the Jet Propulsion Laboratory specifically does things that no other place does, right? The latest Mars rover, and they've got all kinds of missions that just, I mean, it's amazing, really. Uh, so, but the reality, you know, my expectations, as you can probably tell from my description of, of the place, my expectations for working there, I'm thinking, you know, innovation and just like pushing the boundaries of what's possible. And as someone who's always interested in doing things better and um, pushing the status quo, I just, my mind, you know, was running wild with what would be possible working in a place like that. But unfortunately, high expectations sometimes mean that the reality, you know, mm -hmm. has a lot to live up to. And I was, I was shocked that I felt like I was going back 10 plus years in terms of the learning and development approach and attitudes as well. And so this is where <laughs> I'll try to keep it short and sweet because I'm afraid that I might, you know, discourage other people or, you know, mm -hmm. again, burst bubbles. But and that's not my intention. It was just it was it was absolutely shocking. And they the corner of the lab that I was in, I will not, uh, you know, it's very the culture is very localized. And so a different experience most certainly could have been had elsewhere at the lab. But it was they were so. They were their number one priority was the status quo and the status quo was 90 slide PowerPoints that had been made seven, eight years ago, and they really just wanted someone to coordinate the lecture sessions. Mm -hmm. And in this day and age to be in the video conference to click the next button on the slide. And so I went through different phases of trying to figure out how to help them see what is possible beyond that, because the audience for these sorts of things just they wanted more and different, right? This was not working well for the attendees. It was working well for the seasoned experts who have been doing this for decades. So there's that tension, but in that type of workplace, it's very traditional and the hierarchy is very important. You know, trying to push the experts uh, out of their comfort zone proved to be an insurmountable challenge mm -hmm. for me. And so, and I think right now they're experiencing a lot of challenges just in terms of they're very uncomfortable with working virtually or hybrid, right? They're a very in-person workplace. And so they they feel like they're already out of their comfort zone by doing lectures in a video conference call versus a conference room. And I just think that they're not ready. Uh, they're not in a place where they're ready to go to the next level in other right. dimensions. Wow, that is fascinating, which... It sounds like that is what, I mean, it just perfectly kind of led you to becoming a freelancer. Yeah. And yeah. Um, especially like, you know, dealing with the hierarchy and sort of, you know, wanting to be innovative and having control sort of of your own destiny type of, th you know, it, you made the decision um, to start your own, your, your own company. And it was it, I'm sorry, Indie Low Design LLC. That's what you've got yeah. going. So tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, so that's really been the focus here in the last month or so is getting the infrastructure in place for an LLC. And I'm I'm testing the waters, if you will, of doing freelance full time. And it's been great to have the the conference or the sessions last week and hear mm -hmm. from others who've been working in this. So I've been trying to work by network connections, right? I have been working on a project for a regional utility that's through a, a connection. I've I've testing the waters of Upwork. I completed a project yesterday, a little mini one for fun. And then also a couple of documentation. Um, 
been thing uh, to explore that world a little bit. So I'm curious as to see what will happen and how much I enjoy it. But I do, um, thanks Danny, I see your chat message there. Um, it is it is a little uncomfortable to be out of the routine of always having stuff to work on and uh, knowing exactly what the next day is going to hold, but that's also exciting. And so at this time, I feel very fortunate that I can embrace sort of the exciting side of the uncertainty of it. Right, right. No, and um, yeah, I love Danny's comment as well. It, I mean, it, it it's so important. I wish that somebody had I, I wish I'd learned stuff like this like years ago because it's, you know, having to sort of work your way through it has been kind of painstaking. Um, I think this is the first time that it's ever taken like 25 minutes to kind of talk about your L and D path, which is absolutely amazing. You've just had one that is so, I don't know, it 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 is has so many twists and changes and um and it really is um an interesting story but let me ask you some of these questions that we have like um in our in our QA area um so how about your favorite part what do you love being about or what's your favorite part of being a, a, an instructional designer or an L&D professional I'd say there's three categories one is I love learning new stuff so that's probably evident from my uh, academic past as my professional past I love learning so there's that aspect I love helping people and that is at my core what I really am trying to achieve through instructional design and then as I've already touched on I love to help improve things so I I I see there's some of those um, home renovation shows. I'm amazed by people that can walk into a just a, a trashed home and just see the potential for <laughs> what that space can be, that physical space. And I kind of have started to think of myself as one of those people, but in terms of workplace learning um, specifically, it's like oh I can God. see a disaster of a course. And actually the regional utility I'm doing a project for, they sent me over one of their courses and I'm essentially doing a makeover. It's like, here's what we have. <laughs> Um, what are your ideas for how to do this differently? And I'm like, oh, I've got a, I've got a dozen ideas, you know, how about this one or this one? Uh -huh. So I feel like I almost have that approach to workplace learning in particular is like, oh, right. There's like, you could do this, but we could also do right. these other things. So. Oh my gosh. Wouldn't that be fun? An L and D makeover kind of show. If only <laughs> like, you know, we could get HGTV to come in and. <laughs> <laughs> do something like that. Sign I love me up. <laughs> so with this, like, um, you know, with, with what has happened in your career over the last couple of years and, and um, just everything that you've kind of gathered about your current journey, is there something, are there some things that you wish you had known when you had started on this path? Yeah, I think that's a, such a good question. I, th I think the one thing I wish I would have known back then, seven or eight years ago in particular, is that the thing, the opportunities that don't pan out can often be just as important or provide useful information as the opportunities that do pan out. And I also mention this now because this is kind of the pep talk I'm giving myself on a weekly basis right now, right? Things don't seem to happen as quickly or easily as I want them to. And it's like, you know what, there's, you know, sometimes it's okay that that happens, you know, leaving yourself open to other opportunities sometimes works out. So I have passed up or been passed up for opportunities in the past that felt heartbreaking and devastating at the time. And in hindsight, it actually, I think, was a huge favor to myself um, to push myself in different directions or to increase my skill set or expand my skill set to remain open for something better. I love it. That is, that's amazing. That is a really good piece of advice. Um, yeah. Yeah. You, you, Laura, you just seem so interesting. I just, I can imagine, especially like starting out as, you know, Bill, you um, putting together YouTube videos for your students and just sort of your, 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 um, your, your um, preference for innovation or just wanting to do that. Um, I can't wait to see what happens in your career. It seems like you're just going to do marvelously well. So how do you stay on top of your professional development? Oh, well, thanks, Luis, for your generous yeah, words. Sure. It's kind. <laughs> professional development, I uh, there's a couple of categories. One, I read and listen to podcasts. Like I just have an extensive appetite for those things. Anything Adam Grant, 
Um, I've got multiple books sitting next to me. I'm currently going through Nancy Duarte's data story. And that's the other thing too, is I love things that are kind of tangential to learning and development. Mm. So I'm very interested in web design and UX design and also data visualization. Those things kind of, they seem like they overlap in some ways with mm -hmm. learning and development. And I always get ideas from seeing examples or what other people are doing, whether it's in L&D or elsewhere, that always inspires me to like, oh, that's so interesting. Or I love how that looks, or I love the functionality of that, or the way it's organized. Like I could do something like that. Mm -hmm. I'll just mm -hmm. keep that in my back pocket until that becomes useful. Right. So Is you, do you feel like, like, as far as your skill sets are concerned, you're more on kind of the development side of things, um, just building uh, like on the design part of like sort of visual design? You know, I do love that, Luis. I've been having to ask myself these questions as I try to figure out what my focus is for freelancing, right? Because I can I can do it all, but I don't know if that I want to. So, and this kind of ties back with an earlier question about moving from higher ed to the corporate world. Uh, the other thing I didn't mention, but will now, is the huge leap for me was when I was uh, working in higher ed as an instructional design consultant, Oftentimes, I wasn't doing the development. I was helping to guide someone else, and we might uh, we might contract out the development work for online uh, e-learning content. Then, working in the corporate world, it was like you know you're doing all Addy, all phases, all the time, right? So you had to do it all. And I I loved that, and I spent a lot of time in Articulate and Camtasia and Captivate, and so really hon like built out my skill set and uh, built the chops, whatever, got the chops for those sorts of development tools. And that has served me well since. Um, but these days I enjoy the front end analysis mm. the most and the front end an analysis and the design. So I like trying to figure out what the actual, you know, the root problem is and coming up with potential solutions mm -hmm. to coordinate with that. I love to do the development, especially because of the visual elements. But I think if I was to choose my time to allocate my time, it would be in the front end analysis and the design. Fascinating. Wow. That is great. Okay. Well, I've hit my time. I'm going to ask you one more question. Yeah. Um, if you weren't an L&D professional, what do you think you'd be? I think I'd be a pilot. Well, I am a pilot, but I think I would do that professionally. So that's uh, that world appeals to me as well. I think it's the adventure and the, wow. the travel. So just okay. Now I'm curious. What do you mean? What you're a pilot? What do you, I mean? You just have a pilot's license, or I do. Yes. Yeah. So and I and just that takes a lot of time, right? It does. Yeah. yeah. That was that was um, even though I have a few degrees and grad school was challenging, but uh, earning my private pilot's license in my late 30s was probably one of the biggest challenges and actually helped me a lot to be a learner again, right? I did not know anything about uh, flying or aviation. So I was I was starting from the bottom up. And so that was such a humbling experience to be put back in a true beginner's uh, seat and to try to learn as an adult. I faced challenges with trying to find the right instructor and it took me a lot longer than I anticipated. It took me well over a year and a half, if not two years to finish everything. Yeah. My husband's a pilot. He finished his in like four months, right? So I had this like really strange um, comparison point that was probably unfair. But uh, anyways, I, I just fly for fun right now, just for recreation. Um, but it is it is the coolest thing I've ever done for wow. sure. And it is it adds another dimension to uh, to life that that's that's fun. So that's great, Laura. Oh, that's awesome. Thank you for sharing that. It's it, it. Yeah, that is amazing. I don't think I mean, you know, what was the last member showcase? We had somebody who um, we had. Um, a guest who was in a cosmetologist, di dietetics, um, uh, and now here you are, pilot. That's that's great. That's great. Yeah, I know, Bobby. We do need a part two with Laura. Just, I'm sure that you. Have, I mean, you're just really articulate about your story, and um, and I am definitely gonna just 
keep in contact because it'll be interesting to see how um how, how you move forward with your with with your freelance it's gonna i'm sure you're gonna do um wonderfully well so laura thanks so much for um participating today i also want to mention um that uh, laura is like uh uh, a mentor through TLDC. Um, we've connected Laura with with a mentee um, just this past week. And if there's anybody in chat or in the audience that is interested in mentoring, I still have like maybe three or four um, folks that are looking to uh, to uh, to find a mentor. So if you're interested at all, send me a message, uh, Luis at the TLDC.com. Um, or message me through the website or on Slack. You can find me. Just uh, let me know if you're interested in 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 um, in helping out that way. Really appreciate it. And um, with that, I'm going to close it out. Laura, thanks again so much for doing this. I appreciate your time and 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 thank you for supporting the training, learning, and development community. Oh, thank you, Luis. This has been fun, and thank you all. All right, you bye everybody. Have a great day.